Good morning. Last week, I uh, was up in the sound booth, so I couldn't do an announcements. I couldn't do the morning greet, so I got, was it last week or two weeks ago? Last week was Eric. Eric did an incredible job. Eric, if you're listening, way to go. We'll have you back just to do that job again, because I don't do it quite as well as you do. <laughs> um, today, after service, we're going to do uh, continue the prayer walk over the town. Um, so if you have time, please come and get involved in that. Um, praying over the city is something that we like to do every year before we do the Come Alive. And remember to pray for Come Alive. Remember to pray for the people that are organizing that and getting that ready. Um, also, we have a, a fellowship event coming up. Um, the Summer Beach Party. Is that next Sunday? Yeah, next Sunday. So after church next Sunday, we're going to, weather permitting, we're going out to Crimson Lake and enjoying some fellowship time out there. It's potluck, so um, bring beach stuff, and, and uh, yeah, we're at Crimson Lake. Uh, look for, uh, I have to zoom in because my eyes aren't good. Just look for the rest of us. <laughs> and invite friends. <clears throat> uh, come Alive, we're doing it September 11th, that's a Saturday. And we're going to be down on Main Street between 10.30 and 7.30 p.m. So it's going to be an all-day thing. Looking for people to come down and, and uh, just be there and, and be a presence. And pray for people if that's the need. Or, or fellowship with people if that's the need. Just to be there. <clears throat> There's going to be foods, uh, kids' tent, uh, youth tent. We need, we need people that would volunteer for any of those. Or any of, or all of them. Um, there's hospitality, cleaning, uh, and then there's uh, prayer. It, there's going to be a prayer tent there, so if people need prayer, they can go across, right? And uh, okay. Um, so, Father, we lift these things to you right now. These uh, things that our church is doing is useless without you. You, you got to be there. You got to. Be involved with what we're doing. We have to follow your lead. And Father, we just pray that, um, that your presence would draw people to the Come Alive event and that we would unite the churches and that we would be able to work together in, in unity. And Father, that would bring out the community, that they, there was, there'd be people in the community that have never, would never go to church that would meet us on Main Street and find out who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask Helen to come up for our prayer for the week. And I think, okay, that should work. Am I on? Oh, okay. Good morning. Um. So the prayer for this week is praying for our family members that are unsaved and how important it is to, for us even praying for our community because you could be praying for someone else's family that's unsaved. Um, I went to see my folks the middle of July because my dad was not doing well. And the first day I was able to see him, I went with my sister and we all held hands and we prayed. My sister cried, and my dad squeezed my hand, and he's got dementia, so I talked to him about Jesus, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and I feel like I have to keep telling him over and over, and it's like, no, Helen, trust the Holy Spirit. He'll do the rest. So I just felt desperate for his salvation because I don't know, you know, how long he's going to be with us, and so I think it's just important to pray for our community. Um, So let's pray. Let's join together with other believers around our nation for our unsaved family members. May God do a mighty work in their hearts and send the right people, if not us, send the right people around, Lord God, with godly wisdom so that they may believe on the Lord Jesus, for he is the way, the truth, and the life. In Jesus' name, amen. And just something that I was reading here is God wants us, rather than trying hard to live for him, 
to allow him to live through us and to be led by the Holy Spirit. It's so important. And God, may we be bold and courageous in that. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Good morning, everyone. We're going to sing some songs of uh, praise and worship to our Lord this morning. Just going to read out of Psalm 100. Uh, this is a theme uh, verse for the music ministry here, but it pertains to all of us because uh, this is what we want, to, uh, one way we want to uh, have it look like when we worship God. Uh, Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. Isn't that an awesome statement? We're his, yeah. yeah. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. What an awesome God we serve. Let's stand this morning as we sing some songs of praise to our God. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. Yes, I want to see you. Open the eyes. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you, Lord, I want to see you, to see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Open the eyes, open the eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, yes, I want to see you, open our eyes, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you, yes, I want to see you, to see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Lord, pour out your power and love as we sing holy, 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 to see you high and lifted it up and shining in the light of your glory lord pour out your power and love as we sing holy 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 sing holy 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 i want to see you we sing holy 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 i want to see you yes i want to see you Lord, I want to see you. You choose the humble and raise them high. You choose the weak and make them strong you heal the brokenness inside and give us life 
The same love that set the captives free. The same love that opened eyes to see is calling us all by name. You are calling us all by name. The same God that spread the heavens wide. The same God that was crucified is calling us all by name. You are calling us all by name. You take the faithless one aside and speak the words, you are mine. You call the cynic and the proud, come to me now. The same love that set the captives free, the same love that opened eyes to see is calling us all by name. You are calling us all by name. The same God that spread the heavens wide. The same God that was crucified is calling us all by name. You are calling us all by name. You're calling, you're calling. You're calling us to the cross. You're calling, you're calling, you're calling us to the cross. You're calling, you're calling, you're calling us to the cross. You're calling, you're calling, you're calling us to the cross same love that set the captives free the same love that opened eyes to see is calling us all by name you are calling us all by name the same god that spread the heavens wide the same god that was crucified is calling us all by name calling us all by name you're calling you're calling you're calling us to the cross you're calling you're calling you're calling us to the cross you're calling you're calling you're calling you're calling us to the cross. You're calling, you're calling, you're calling us to the cross. Where 
Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow. Whom you love, I'll love. How you serve, I'll serve. If this life I lose, I will follow you. Yeah, I will follow you. Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name, Master. fragrance after the rain Jesus 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 let all heaven and earth There's something about that name. Let's sing Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Let all heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away, but there's something about that name. Let all heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away, but there's something about that name. Yes, there's something about that name.
There's a reason why the curse of sin is broken. There's a reason why the darkness runs from light. There's a reason why we stand here now forgiven. Jesus is alive. There's a reason why we are not overtaken. There's a reason why we sing on through the night. There's a reason why our hope remains eternal. Jesus is alive. So pray the King, He is risen, praise the King, He's alive, praise the King, death's defeated, hallelujah, He's alive. There's a reason why our hearts can be courageous. There's a reason why the dead are made alive. There's a reason why we share his resurrection. Jesus is alive. Oh, he's alive. So pray. The King, He is risen. Praise the King, He's alive. Praise the King, death's defeated. Hallelujah, He's alive. Hallelujah, He's alive sing the grave the grave could not ignore it all of heaven's roaring hell where is your victory death where is your sting the world could not ignore it all the saints are roaring hell where is your victory Death, where is your sting? The grave could not ignore it. All of heaven's roaring. Hell, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? The world could not ignore it. And all the saints are roaring. Hell, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? Praise the King. He is risen. Praise the King. He's alive. Praise the King. Death's defeated. Hallelujah. Alive, praise the King, praise the King, He is risen, praise the King, He's alive, praise the King, death's defeated, hallelujah, He's alive.
great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages step down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame the cross has spoken i am forgiven the king of kings calls me his own beautiful savior I'm yours forever, Jesus Christ, my living home. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living home. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Then came, then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Declared the grave has no claim on me. Jesus, yours is the victory. Sing hallelujah, praise the one who set me free, hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me, and you have broken every chain, there's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ. its grip on me you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name jesus christ my living hope jesus christ my living hope jesus christ
we serve a risen, living Savior. All those other small G gods are dead, buried in the ground, rotting. Our God lives and moves and reigns over this planet. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the one who set us free. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You guys can have a seat. Amen. Praise the Lord. Oh, it's good to feel his presence. Whew. Hmm. <laughs> okay, we'll start with the irony. Um, my message today is, uh, we're not going to, uh, I want to do the children's video before this, but I want you to see, this is, the, this is the name of my message. How do you hear the voice of God? And this morning, aiming to be here at about 9 o'clock, at about 10 to 9, I started looking for my keys. <laughs> We stopped and prayed three times for God to tell me where those keys are. Four times. Thank you, Gaddy Lou. Mickey had to come pick me up this morning <laughs> to, to bring me to church because I still don't know where those keys are. And I have been desperately trying to hear the voice of God this morning. <laughs> and, and yeah, um, he has a sense of humor. But I want to go to that, the clip that we had from two weeks ago. Um, we did a camp at The Rock. Uh, Faith Bible Camp came down, and they ran a, a camp here. Now, uh, I have been connected with Faith Bible Camp now for the last five years, four or five years. That's not true, though. I was a speaker there five years ago. But when I arrived there and I found out all the, the heritage, all the legacy that Faith Bible Camp, they used to run out of Covenant Bay on Pigeon Lake. And the reason I'm here today and the reason I'm speaking in front of you today has a ton to do with what God did through the people that have been connected with Faith Bible Camp since before I knew the Lord. And when I went down there to speak and I realized how many people have taught and worked and... and <laughs> I don't know how old grandma... <laughs> There's this 85-year-old lady that works with crafts, she did five years ago. And, and she just loved to be around the little kids. And she's, she, she's getting so old that she can't manipulate the crafts the way she does. And she doesn't. She, she's got other people that do that. She just loves on the kids at the craft booth. <laughs> and, and the kids come to camp to talk to grandma and tell her what they've done the following year. There's, there's presidents of the Faith Bible Camp that are the president of the board that remember being a kid in camp and having grandma do crafts with them. So there is never a time when God takes us out of ministry where we can retire from ministry. It is so cool. Anyways, I say all that to say that we had a blast. Go ahead. Have you been running that clip as I've been talking? There, there's some faces in here you might recognize. There's some other faces that you won't recognize on purpose because um, we're not going to send some faces over the, over the internet. But we had fun these last two, this, this last week. Two weeks ago, we had camp for, two, for a week at The Rock. They did all kinds of stuff inside The Rock, and it was kind of a startup for The Rock again. Because since then, we've opened up The Rock on last Friday, and um, it's just so good after, after COVID to be back in there doing ministry again. It's, it, we just had so much fun. Everything was used. Um, we have, <laughs> we have ca candy in the rock from, that was purchased before COVID. <laughs> some of the, yeah, I, I got to love one of the fathers of some of the kids. We, sa we sent some prizes home with the kids, and we sent them sugar. <laughs> and one of the fathers said, yeah, no problem. I, I understand you sent them sugar. So the next day, he sends it back with them in their lunch. <laughs> yeah, touche. <laughs> well done. <laughs> But I just want you guys to know, because I'm, I'm one of the volunteers out there at The Rock, that The Rock is going again. We are moving again. We're looking for volunteers to run some of the programs. One of my main volunteers is uh, still one of my main volunteers, one of The Rock's main volunteers, because I'm a volunteer as well. But one of the main volunteers is 
He usually runs the Monday night program. It's basically the same as Friday. It just ends a little sooner because it's a school night. Um, he is working for the town of Rocky Mountain House as well as going to college right now. So that will run, he will be doing that until the end of September, and then he may um, pick up the Monday nights. But right now we're running Friday nights, and Friday night we got the word out on Facebook, we got the word out on Main Street for the Main Street uh, Market on Main, and uh, people were getting, t knowing that the rock was opening, but you know what it's like, word of mouth, it needs to get out there. So we were expecting, you know, seven to ten people last uh, Friday night to come for our first opening, which is really cool because we opened on Friday the 13th. We tend to, tend to do weird things like that. We didn't do it on purpose, that's just the way it worked out, but we had 12 kids there. Yeah, that was, that's, that's, a, that's a decent number for the first night, and especially in the summertime, so it was good to have it going again. And everybody said the same thing. It's so good to be back. It's so good to be here. And, it, and some of the kids, there was two girls there that had never come before, and they were... They, fit right in. The, the mentality at the Rock is everybody fits in, so it's, it, was, it was pretty cool to run it last night. Well, like Friday night. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see if this works. Like I said, my message was about hearing God, and uh, my morning has been a little bit exciting. <laughs> trying to hear the voice of God. Um, if you have your Bibles with you, let's look into our word. Thank you, Lord, for your, your word. Thank you that you speak to us through your word so many times. There's so many other ways you can speak to us, but primarily you use your word. That's why we are empowered as Christians to know your word and to Ask the Holy Spirit to teach us from your word. Thank you, Lord, that we can hear your voice and we can know who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. So if I could get you to turn to John chapter 10, we're going to read verse 27. So that's John chapter 10. Chapter 10, verse 27. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them. And they know me. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me, depending on the version you're reading. That's what I want to talk about tonight, or today. <laughs> you can tell I'm a youth pastor. I usually speak at night, right? <clears throat> Last week, John, uh, Dennis preached about, we can't say we love Jesus and not follow and be obedient. And... I, I, I was so convicted by that message. It was so good. Um, I don't fully b believe some of my brothers who said that, that means no TV anymore, but uh, <laughs> we were joking about it after service. But there's a seriousness about what we watch. We, we got to be cautious because we're like a computer, right? You put garbage in, you get garbage out. And we want to focus on what's pure and what's holy because that's what we want coming out. But this whole idea of hearing God, and it's easy for a child to say, I didn't hear you say that, Daddy. <laughs> and I think sometimes that's our excuse. I, I'm, I, I didn't, I'm not obedient because I didn't hear clearly that was God. And I think sometimes um, we're like that kid that puts their hand over their ears. <laughs> I can't hear you, I can't hear you. But we can err to the other extreme too. And I want that to be the basis of my message today, that, that sometimes we think we need to earn the right to hear God's voice. And I want to do some, uh, some groundwork to understand a, a little bit of 
the Bible, how it talks about hearing the voice of God all the way through. And what, that... Uh, the controller has a red ring around it. I think the batteries might be gone. Can I get you to advance that to the next screen? Mm. Uh, the next screen should just be the tabernacle. We've jumped ahead. There we go. Um, I, why I'm going back to the tabernacle because th there's a framework here. Um, if you understand what came before Christ was the tabernacle. The way the Hebrews approached God was in the rules and regulations of the tabernacle. Now, you're, let's just... Yeah. Leviticus is where we find all this information. And it's, it's, it's very written like a law book. Okay? And there's so much detail in it. But you have, to, you have to study it and you have to look at it in a way that... What would the common guy do because of those rules? And I just want to break it down to that. So, you've messed up. You've done something wrong, and you want to get right with God. So you pick an animal out of your flock that's without spot or blemish, and you bring it to the temple priests. Now you stand at the door. There's only one door. There's not many doors. There's only one door. Just point that out. <laughs> and you come in, and there's that yellow thing in the middle. That's the brazen altar. And you can see all the way around, it looks a little bit like a butcher shop. And that's pretty much what it was. That... The, the certain pieces were taken out of the animals and the Levite, the priests, they, they got to survive on that, the, the, the stuff that was sacrificed. That's how they, they didn't raise animals. They took care of the, the, the tabernacle. So they were fed from the sacrifices from the Hebrews. So you're just a regular Hebrew. You bring it in. They doctor the animal. They do the right thing. And then they bring it up or they, they clean it or whatever. And then you, it's still alive. And then you put your hands on it, on its head, and you say, I don't know if it was out loud or just to yourself, but you say, those things that I have done, those sins that I have committed to God or to others, I place on this animal. And let it be done to it what should be done to me. And then the priests take it and they cut it open and they take those pieces and then they, everything else is burned on the brazen altar to dust. It's just destroyed. And this picture of the sin being transferred over to that animal so that the sin could be dealt with. Because it's that sin that prevents us from entering into the presence of God. It's like we live here in Rocky, and in order to reach the West Country, you can't because of the Saskatchewan River. So it's impossible for us in Rocky to get to the West Country, right? No, somebody built a bridge. We can't get to God because of sin. And there's nobody here that can say there's no sin in their life. Just like back in the Old Testament, they dealt with the sin so that they could come to God. Jesus is our bridge. We don't have to sacrifice animals. We have the sacrifice of Jesus. But I want to I put this in perspective. We can cross into the West Country. Somebody has built a bridge. What's the purpose of dealing with our sin? So that we can enter the presence of God. Just like in the tabernacle, they did the animal sacrifice. That made them right with God so that they can enter into a relationship, enter into a conversation, enter into communication with God. And we can see it. Some of them did, like David, and, and like, there's many, many that did. They spent time in that area of the temple before the brazen altar, and they communicated with God. They, they did their best to, to lay their hearts out for God. The dealing was the, with the sin isn't what made them right with God. I, I say that tentatively because it did make them right with God. That's what allowed them to enter into God's presence. But it's one thing to say, good, our debt's dealt with, bye. And it's another thing to say, Good, our doubts dealt with? Good, let's push that aside. I just want to get to know you. I just want to talk with you. D do you see the difference? And that's what I'm talking about. So it, some of us believe that we have to jump through hoops to impress God so that he can talk to us. 
And that's not the case. The things we need to do in order to hear from God isn't to impress him so that he's standing there waiting for us. If we go to the next slide. It's so that our ears are ready. So our our countenance is ready so that we can hear from him. He's always speaking. God is always speaking. Might have to take it all the way back to the beginning, Tim. If we take it right to the beginning, because we're... If you close it, the little one down here. I'm so sorry. This was all supposed to work on the little finger and... If you no, nope. the the two little arrows down at the bottom here that expand it to full screen. If you close it, nah. <laughs> Anyways, I don't need the PowerPoint. I can just talk. Makes it easier for the guys online. But <clears throat> God's always there waiting for us. Always wanting to speak with us. He's always there, and it's not that we have to jump through the hoops so that He's impressed. It's so that we we prepare ourselves to hear from him. I'm reminded of a joke. Um, <laughs> woman is having problems with a plug in her kitchen, and she asks her husband, would you mind looking at that today? I think there's a short in it. I'm not too sure what's going on. And so then she goes away, and when she comes back about an hour or so later, she, she walks into the kitchen, and her husband is standing in front of that plug, and she, he's... <laughs> And so she goes, oh my goodness. So she grabs a wooden broom, not a metal broom, but a wooden broom because she knows what's happening. So then she gets in beside him and she jabs the broom in between the wall and her husband and she just reefs on it as hard as she can to get him away from that plug and keep him from being electrocuted. And he falls down on the ground and looks up at her and goes, what? And she's like, you were being electrocuted. He says, no, I wasn't. I had my iPod in. I was dancing. <laughs> Sometimes we need to pull the iPod out of our ears to hear what's going on in the world. And sometimes we need to prepare our ears to hear from God. (laughs) You won't forget that, will you? Yeah, we go to the next slide and it's the verse. For God, for it is God who works in you to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. I didn't memorize it this way. The way I memorized it was, for it is God that is in you to will and to do his good purpose. He's waiting not just to speak to us, but to empower us to do the things he wants us to do. He's not waiting for us to jump through hoops to be found worthy for him to speak to us. He is waiting with bated breath so that he can not just explain to us what to do, but to give us the power to do it. And and strangely enough, the will, if, if I read this verse correctly, it says to will and to do his good pleasure. God doesn't just empower us to be able to do it. When we come to him, he empowers us to want to do it. That blows my mind. It's okay. He is not waiting for us to be good enough. He's not waiting for us to be, to do the right things. He's not waiting for us to be the right person. He is waiting for us to hear him. That's it. Like I said, Dennis preached last week about hearing the voice of God. And I sometimes think that I have a a rebellion problem because I'm constantly not doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Or or I have a a weak will. But I'm learning more and more as I walk with the Lord. It's not about my will and it's not about my rebellion. It's about what I love more than him. And when I love him and I spend time with him, he empowers me to do what I need to do. <clears throat> Romans 12.2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern 
what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So the next slide. How do we discern the voice of God from all the other voices in the world? Well, there's a theme that runs through the Bible as well where any of the great heroes of faith, so many of them didn't start off with God doing something great around them or in them and then them trusting God and then them becoming a great and powerful hero. Most of them started with trusting God first. How do we trust God enough to hear him? <clears throat> if we go to the next slide. These are some of the things I need, we, we need to prepare ourselves. The, the way we need to open up our ears, the way we need to, like they slaughtered the sheep back when. Trust is the first one. And submitting, being pure, waiting on him, expecting, and then practicing. But we'll break these down one at a time. But I think we need to first, one more slide, take the big picture. It's all about growing in our relationship with God. When we, you think about any relationship we've had in our life, we don't, we're not born great communicators. And in every relationship we have in our life, we communicate to them a little differently, don't we? You have a different vocabulary. I mean, with my wife and I, she's French. We have a different language sometimes. <laughs> when I was growing, when my kids were growing up, if I said, sweetheart, close that door, they'd be say, what? I'd say, close the door. Oh, I'm, I'm busy. Fermez le porte. They knew I meant business. They knew I was, I was done, that I was spoke French. Daddy, the Anglophone, just spoke French. That means I'd do it right now. And they did, right? <laughs> if I did that to anybody else, they would go, I know you said close the door, but what was the last bit? I don't know, right? We, we communicate differently to every, in every relationship we have. And, and we learn to communicate specifically to those people that are closer to us. We communicate differently to people that are, we're intimate with differently than we communicate to anybody else. The truth is the same about God. We communicate to him. He communicates to us. And the really cool thing is every one of us has a relationship with him. So the way he communicates to you is going to be different than the way he communicates to me. So I can't tell you this is the way he's going to talk to you every single time because I'm not in that relationship you have with God. The way he talks to you is going to be formatted to the way your personality is, which he made, so he knows how to communicate to you better than anybody else. Next slide. Okay, we're back to trust. There's this, next slide. There's this really cool verse if I can bring it up, I'll just turn around and read it off the screen. <laughs> Second Corinthians 4.17. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that is far outweighs them all. Paul wrote this. And if you know the story of Paul, light and momentary troubles is kind of funny because that man went through a ton. He was left for dead a few times. The really cool thing is when he wrote this verse, he was chained to somebody in prison. Not just in prison, but chained to someone in prison. And, and it, the Roman government believed that they were right by might. They were right because they were strong enough to say they were right. So can you imagine a prisoner that would have a contrary view, the, the, the guards and the soldiers? You can make yourself right by enough might. Light and momentary troubles, he says. Light and momentary troubles. How much of our lives do we go through light and momentary troubles? They're quite as light and momentary as what, as what Paul probably went through every day. And yet there he is. That's trust. That's trust. How do we get to that kind of trust? I think there's, there's two different ways, we, uh, there's two different things we need to put in place. The, the next slide. It's our perspective. Our perspective 
Next slide. Life is hard. We go through life and sometimes we focus on this little bit. I mean, if we live 100 years, oh, wouldn't that be awesome if we could all, I can say to all of you, you're going to live 100 years. Not really. Right? Because if you think about of eternity, that's heaven. Next slide. Life is hard, but it's short. Heaven's eternity. Francis Chan. Oh, and I got his name right that time. Thank you, Lord. Because I always say Jackie Chan and people go, huh? Um, <laughs> Francis Chan does, the, does this analogy where he carries a rope on the stage. And the rope is off, the other end of the rope is off stage somewhere, but he carries in this, the, the end of this rope and he comes up to the pulpit and he's, he talks about a couple that work this part. And he's got a little bit of red tape on the end of this rope work all this time, and he has a little bit of blue tape right at the end. He says, so that they can retire for this blue tape, right? So they work all this time, so they, the goal is so that they can retire in that, that, that area right there. And, and this is our life, and the rest of the rope is really how long we're going to live. And when our focus is that little blue strip, we miss the meaning of why we're here. And when our perspective is that little blue strip, we can waste our life because the perspective is eternity. So if, now the other side of that is, what can happen in that little bit of time that would wreck the rest? Not much, eh? And when our perspective is all of eternity, we're going to be with him in heaven, it's easy to trust him here with the little things we'll go through. And that's where Paul was the light and momentary troubles. Now, the other side of that is... Next slide. He has proven his trustworthiness. Next slide. Let's, there's a story in Joshua 4, and you kids back there, you remember it, right? We acted it out in the parking lot out here. Oh, that one? Yeah, that one. <laughs> the, the, the nation of Israel had come out of Egypt... And Moses had led them through the desert for 40 years, and it was only the ones that were going to enter the promised land left in the nation of Israel. And God talked to Moses, and he says, you're going to hand off the people to, to Joshua, and Joshua is going to take them in over the, over the Jordan River. But you have to listen, and you have to do it my way. And Joshua's like, okay, God, how are you going to lead us in? And so God says to Joshua, you're going to take the Levites, and they're going to pick up the Ark of the Covenant, and they're going to walk down to the Jordan, and everybody else is going to be about a kilometer, and I looked it up, and I did the math, and it's almost exactly a kilometer. Isn't that cool? Anyways, um, <laughs> so I took the kids down to the street, and I said, see this, this, the stop sign all the way down near the, the uh, Agron building, okay? Yeah, the MD office, right? So imagine all of us are all the way on the other side of that stop sign, and the Ark of the Covenant is, you look down by the, the, the car wash, the big truck car wash down there, all the way down there. Okay, that's how far away. You could probably see that little group of people, but you wouldn't know what was going on there, right? That's how far away the, the, the Israelites were from the Ark of the Covenant when the Ark of the Covenant stepped into the Jordan River. Now, the Jordan River is a river at high water that you cannot cross. It's like us in the West Country. Yeah, you just take a jaunt across the Saskatchewan River. Just walk across there. You go right ahead. Yeah, not going to happen, right? Okay, now the Jordan River in, in some spots is even wider than the Saskatchewan River. But it's, yeah, that's a good place to think. So these guys carrying the Ark of the Covenant walk down to the river, and God said they're going to cross on dry land. The people are going to walk on dry land. And the guys carrying the Ark of the Covenant step out into the river and get their feet wet. And it's, the water's not changing. And Joshua's like, it's okay. God said do it, so do it. So now they have both feet wet. And the lead guys are up to their knees. And then something happens. So we're, the Ark of the Covenant is in the river. And the guys behind aren't in the, the, the river yet. But the guys out in front are going to drown before the guys in the back are in the river, right? And the Ark of the Covenant crosses over that threshold where it is now over the river. And the water stops flowing upstream, but continues to flow downstream. So the water in front of them starts to... 
And the water there is piling up for no reason. But there's still water in front of them, so the guy in the lead is still walking through about ankle deep water until he makes it to the ri- middle of the river where they wait. And the last of the water flows away from them. And the water is piling up. This isn't the Red Sea. This happened 40 years after the Red Sea. But you know the ones that were alive to come through the Red Sea, they're remembering this. So they get stopped in the middle of the Red Sea. No, in the middle of the Jordan River. And they signal back to the rest of the Israelites, come on through. So everybody crosses the river right there on this dry patch. Well, it would be getting bigger and bigger as it goes along because the water's flowing away from them, right? So they cross. And they get to the other side. All the people are there on the other side except for the guys that are holding the Ark of the Covenant. And Joshua says, okay, now we're going to take 12 of you one from each tribe, a leader of the men, from one from each tribe, and you 12 are going to go down there into the middle of the river and bring me 12 stones. And we're going to bring it up on the edge of the river so that we can point to this for the rest of the generations and say, God was trustworthy. So what do these stones mean? Next slide. Next slide. There's this really, really cool thing. A Jewish person, if they go to a grave sign, they put a stone on the grave. Did you know that? I've seen it before, but I didn't know why. There's a Hebrew pun. The same word for stone is bound. Now, you put down flowers, and they're going to die, and they're going to dry up, and they're going to blow away. But you put a stone there, It's not going anywhere, is it? But the pun is that when you put down the stone on the graveside, you're saying that person is bound to you in in your memories. Now you think about this. The 12 tribes went down and got a stone that bound them to the memory that God is faithful. God is. Think back in your own life. How many times has God been faithful? How many times has God done stuff that amaze you? That finding a set of car keys is a little thing compared to some of the stuff God has done in my life. Old Testament scripture talks about the Hebrew people remembering and telling to their kids and their grandkids the book of remembrance or the the things to remember. I think if any, every one of us spent one Sunday down in Sunday school and all you did was tell the kids the stuff you can remember that God's done in your life, that would be so good for them and it would be so good for us, wouldn't it? That, that, that idea of bringing up the stuff that God has done in our past, he has proven himself trustworthy. So those two things, we look at our perspective and we look at the fact that he has proven himself trustworthy. That allows it, makes it easier for us to trust. Okay, next slide. Oh, submit. Oh, that's a tough one. I'm not going to tell you that we have the wrong perspective of submission. I might even say that we Submit's a tough word because it means giving over that position of authority in our life. You can't do that before you trust. That's why it's in this order. You have to trust him before you submit to him. Nope, not going to go there. Okay. Um, (laughs) In Matthew chapter 6, verse 10, it says, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Basically, you're saying, not my will, but yours. That means he's in charge. Next slide. About everything and anything, we have to give him that control in our life. When we say, I submit to you, Lord, that's not about the things that, about going to church on Sunday. That's not just the things about spiritual stuff. It's everything. When he 
has control. Remember, he's the one that wants to empower us to do the good thing. So if he has, if he has your submission in every aspect of your life, then he can use all of your life to do the best stuff in your life. Now, and yes, that takes trust first. But there's even one more thing. And it doesn't happen always like this, but nine times out of ten. Next slide. He usually wants the submission before he tells you what it's for. He usually wants you to say, I will do anything and everything before he tells you what to do. With specifics. Next slide. Pure. Mickey didn't sing it this morning, but I bet you lots of you guys know. Create in me a pure heart, oh God. And that's why Mickey's the worship leader, not me. And renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, O oh Lord. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation and renew a right spirit within me. The Lord's Prayer says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. The guy who wrote that psalm was David, King David. And if you read Psalms 51, from that little song piece, which is about three verses, uh, verse 10, verse 11, and verse 12, if you go down and you read all the way to 17, there's a little bit in there where he talks about washing the blood off my hands. David wasn't perfect. If you know his story, he messed up. I can say I was better than David. I didn't murder nobody. <laughs> but he constantly asked for a pure heart. He constantly asked for that that God would be able to take those things out of his heart that got in the way between him and God. And verse 16 and 17 just hit me like a ton of bricks. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offering, but my sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. There's a link. If you are fully trusting and you are fully submitted, it's like green bow breaking a horse. It's not, it's not that the horse is hurt. It's not that the horse is destroyed or you've obliterated their will but they've come to a place where they trust you and they'll submit whatever you want to you and they're willing to be taught. And when we get to that place, I mean, we're not horses because we're way smarter and harder to deal with. <laughs> but when we get to that place where we, we allow him It's not our sacrifices. It's not what we can give to God to bargain with him to get what we want. Because if it was just sacrifice, he'd own all of what we have. <laughs> but it's not. It's our heart. It's the purity. Expectation. Next slide. <clears throat> I love this quote from A.W. Tozer, and I'm going to show you the video that I got it from in just a minute. But I love this idea. The person that does not expect to hear from God won't. <laughs> if you don't think God can talk to you, you've made that choice not to pick up the phone and he can't talk until you pick up the phone. <laughs> Next slide. I, while I was preparing for this message, I came across this video, and you know me, most of my videos, I like to get little videos in there. Um, the YouTube algorithm makes it very difficult to do, but this one, I need you to hear. This one is very, very cool. All right? Give her. 
I want to tell you this before I share with you some principles that actually have transformed the way I spend time in the Word of God. The enemy wants to convince you, he wants to convince me, that God has some sort of hotline connection between he and certain people, that it's just our spiritual leaders, our pastors, our Bible study teachers, the folks that are on staff, the people that are in full-time ministry, the folks that have, you know, a microphone on their jacket, the people that are in the spotlight, the folks who we go past their Instagram feed and we are um, admonished or encouraged because they are teaching and preaching to masses. The enemy wants you to think that it's a seminary degree that is required before you can actually have a fervent, ongoing relationship with God where you yourself can open up the Word of God and know that the Holy Spirit can illumine the scriptures and give you guidance and direction and insight and clarity and encouragement and comfort. He wants you to think that that kind of fervent friendship with God is only for certain people because he knows that as long as you and I are not convinced that we can hear a fresh word from God for ourselves, then at best we'll be handicapped in our faith because we'll always be waiting on somebody else to spoon feed us the word of God instead of knowing that we can have confidence in our friendship, in our relationship with God himself. And I wanna share them with you. Position yourself to hear from God. I'm gonna say it again. Position yourself to hear from God. There is power in your positioning, in your posture. Okay, I mean this in a spiritual sense, but I also mean it in a physical sense. I want to tell you about both. When you come to God through his word, that you're going to meet with him through the pages of scripture. So this is your own personal quiet time. You know, you maybe have just sat up in bed and you're going to have 10 or 15 minutes that you're spending with the Lord, or you're going to come out of your room into the kitchen table, maybe in the quietness of the morning or in the quietness of the evening when all the activity in your house has died down just a little bit. You're going to position yourself over a portion of scripture. And I'll tell you in just a few moments how you can choose a portion of scripture to dive into. But when you make that commitment to posture yourself, to position yourself, I mean that in a spiritual way, meaning the position of your heart has to be uh, in a perspective and a frame of reference that is eager to hear and expects to hear the voice of God speaking to you. It's A.W. Tozier, a great theologian that put it this way, the person that does not expect to hear God won't because every single time God speaks, they'll just discount it as their own idea. They'll think that it was just a coincidence. They will attribute it to anything and anybody else except what it is, God's breathed word coming to life through the power of the Holy Spirit to speak to you, to give you guidance and direction in your own personal life. And so you have to have a heart, I have to have a heart that is filled with expectation that I am one of the sheep of God's fold and I can hear the voice of God. John chapter 10, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. Listen to that again. He basically says the default position for anybody who's a part of the fold, the flock, the family of God, what my sheep do is hear my voice. It's one of the schemes of the enemy to get you to think that you need to be something more, be something else, have a different perspective or a different personality, or be someone other than you are, to have excelled in some way, to not have made the mistakes that you've made. It's the scheme of the enemy to get us to think that we have to be anything other than a son or daughter to have this right, this privilege to hear God speaking to us through the word. So we have to pray and say, Lord, would you carve away anything in my heart that is a roadblock that's keeping me from having an expectation that in my own regular quiet time, while I'm in my pajamas or in my jogging suit, while I'm in my house shoes, whatever I'm doing, and no matter what I look like, I have the privilege to keep company with you, that you want to cultivate, Lord Jesus, thank you, a friendship okay, with me, that you want to... I'm telling you right now, this is a two-part series, and she can preach, can't she? This is really, really good stuff. And I it, it, find it. It's the uh, hearing the voice of God, and it's Priscilla. She, thank you. Priscilla. Oh, she's, she can preach. She is so good. Uh, if, if part of this touches your heart and you want to do a little homework, 
do this. Go find these two-part videos. It's really good. She, she nails it. But, but you see her reiterating the stuff I've talked about. This isn't something for the elite to hear the voice of God. This isn't. This is, you are a blood-bought saint. And I wasn't going to, this isn't even in my notes, but I just learned this recently. <clears throat> Did you know that it was, it was Roman law that you could disown a child that was born into your family? And the ruling was if, if, it wasn't if it was a, a girl and you wanted a boy or if it was a, you know, something was wrong with them physically or something, uh, birthmarks, whatever, right? You could disown a child that was born into your family, but you could never disown an adopted child because you chose that child. There was no legal right to disown an adopted child, and we are adopted by Christ. He will never disown us. Never. Now, he, he's not bound by German, Roman law, but that whole idea when, when Paul talks about us being adopted into the family of God, I'm sure he was thinking of that law. The other thing is, when my kid messes up, totally, totally messes up and comes to me, will Gabby ever say to me, Dad, I don't deserve to be your daughter? What does your mess-ups have to do with whether or not you deserve to be my daughter? You are. That's just a fact. What, how you act has nothing to do. So for us to go to the God and say, I don't deserve to hear your voice because I don't deserve to be a child of God. What does deserving have to do with it? That's the enemy telling you that you don't deserve to be a child of God. And he's lying to you. We deserve you know what? I'm going to even flip that whole idea on its head. God deserves for us to come to him and act like children of God. The fact that we don't deserve it, he already knew that. He chose us anyway. And he's sitting there waiting for us so that he can empower us to do what he has planned for to do. He deserves when we feel undeserving, he deserves for us to come. And I'm going to tell you something really weird. Everything I've told you about how you come to God and how you hear his voice, God has a sense of humor. Because the very first time I heard God's voice, I I'm telling you right now, you're, you're supposed to expect him. And you're supposed to know that it's him that's speaking to you. And you're supposed to go into it expecting. Well, the very first time I remember sitting down on my own couch in Watasquan, Alberta, and saying, okay, God, if you can speak to me, then give me a place to read in the Bible. I'm not asking that you do this. If you, if you have a devotional life, your devotional life should be structured. Don't do a devotional life because you feel you need to do a devotional life. Do it, that would be like giving flowers to your wife every Friday because you need to do it. Now, the first couple of Fridays, she'd be like, wow, that's great. But like 12 years later, she'd be like, yeah, flowers again. You're not doing it because you want to. You're doing it because you think you need to. God doesn't want us to come to him because we think we need to. But if you're doing a devotional life so that he can teach us and so that we can connect with him and so that's your time cut away so that you can be with him, that's a good use. But this first time, I sat down and said, God, I didn't know much about the Bible, very little about the Bible. I said, give me a scripture verse. And he gave me Isaiah 43, 15. Is there 43 books in the book of Isaiah? Like seriously, I'm new as anything, right? I don't even know this. I have to find my Bible. Isaiah 43, 15. Isaiah 43. There's not 43 books in Isaiah. Oh, wow, there is 43 books in Isaiah. This isn't, this isn't God. This is me. This is totally me. It's not God. Not expecting that God can talk to me. Right? This isn't God. This is me. Do you know what Isaiah 43, 15 says? I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your King. So, after telling you, you have to come and you have to be expecting, God has a sense of humor. Now, you guys, some of you know me well enough to know that I have a pretty decent sense of humor. And that would make sense that God would use his sense of humor to get a hold of me. <laughs> a couple of verses later, i got to remember, I was a brand new Christian. Isaiah 43, 18 and 19 says, Look, I'm doing something new. It's going to spring up right in front of you. I'm going to put paths in the wilderness, and I'm going to put streams in the wasteland. He did. He's done something new. 
where I was before and where I am now are two totally different places. God can speak to us right out of Scripture like that. And when we sit down and we plan a devotional, and you have a, a, a plan of where you're going, and you take that plan to the Lord and, and, you, and you let him edit it, you keep your ear to let him tell you to do things differently. When I say that expectation that God can speak to you at every moment, at every day, uh, some of you guys know this personally, and some of you guys have just seen it, but have you ever seen a mom that has a brand new baby in the other room sleeping? She can get a lot accomplished while that baby's sleeping. But there's something about her that is tuned to that cry. Right? Whatever she's doing, that baby, okay, stop what I'm doing here. Go take care of the kid. She, she's doing all this other stuff. She could even be listening to music. But when that baby cries, she hears it. Right? You know what I'm talking about, don't you? That's the expectancy we can have with God. That it doesn't matter what we're doing, God can talk to us in a moment. <laughs> I had a couple of things. Market on Main, a couple of weeks ago, uh, I, this lady stopped me. I have dark marks on my legs because of my diabetes, because I let my blood sugar get too high for too long, and it thinned the skin. And Anyways, it's not a big deal. It really isn't a big deal. But I was wearing shorts, and she saw it. And she said, oh, you have the same problem with your legs as I do with mine. And I said, oh, do you have I had diabetes? And she said, no, I... I dropped something on my leg and it scabbed up the side of my leg. And I said, oh, that's not, not scabs. It's because of my diabetes, whatever I said. And whew, you need to pray for her. Okay, we'll see where we can fit this into the conversation. <laughs> right? That's me, not God. Where I can fit it into the conversation, that's me, right? That's not God. And so we get talking a little bit longer and, and I can feel it, right? I'm getting nervous. Like, I'm going to miss the opportunity. So I just... Uh, can I pray for you right now? She's like, oh, yeah. Okay, that's not the expectation I had, but it's cool. So I got to pray with her, and I ended the prayer by saying, and to show her that God, Jesus, you love her. And then, amen. And she, she looked at me right in the face, and she says, oh, I know he does. <laughs> so I wasn't preaching to somebody that was unsaved. This is a, a believer that knew the Lord, and, and I just prayed with them for their leg, right? But for me, that was like... I was taking a step. I was preaching. I was pray, praying for a, a non-believer and stuff, right? Like, so, but, so was I hearing the, the voice of the Lord to benefit her? No, because the next time I hear that, I'm going to do it, right? So God's teaching me, and he sends me easy things first that I don't get, right? So I, I'm working on it. And I, and I joke about the fact that we stopped four times to pray to find out where those keys were this morning. God knows what he's doing. I trust him. I'm saying that because, yeah, we're going we're gonna to find those keys. <laughs> or he'll have a plan, right? He'll do something else. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> Waiting. A couple of cool verses here. Um, let's, let me say this first. To wait on the Lord in silent expectation, silent uh, listening for God's direction. Different people have different ways of being quiet, to quiet their inner voice. I, I don't know about you, Mickey, but a lot of musicians like to have music playing when they quiet themselves. Are you like that? No, you need to be quiet, eh? But I know some musicians, they like, uh, some people, they like to have music playing. It kind of readies them so they can hear from the Lord. Um, Micah chapter 7, verse 7, But as for me, I watch in hope for the Lord. I wait for my God, my Savior, my God will, I, will hear me. And Psalms 5.3, this is David writing again. In the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my requests before you, and I wait expectantly. We wait expecting God to talk to us. And God talks to us in different ways. I use the analogy of the, of the, the mother listening for the baby. But to take that analogy a little bit further, a baby can tell you what it wants without ever using words, right? God can tell us things without using words. He doesn't, he doesn't always communicate directly out of the words of Scripture. Sometimes it's a, a still, small voice. Some people it's pictures. Some people it's... I love John. You guys know Big John that comes here? If you ever talk about his dogs, 
He tells you what they say to him like they speak English, (laughs) right? The dogs don't say anything, but the way they act and the way they behave, he's learned that's what they mean. Just like a baby, you know, by the way they act or the way they talk or the way they behave that you know what they mean. I've worked with disabled adults lots in my life, and I can think of a few of them, quite a few actually, that were, I I work better with people that don't speak. Maybe it's because I speak so much. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything about my character there. Anyways, um, <laughs> um, I, I can remember a couple of clients where we, we created this communication where they would do something or, or interact in a way with me, and I knew that's what they meant. So, and we came up with a, a quite, a, quite a bit of vocabulary so that I could tell what they wanted by the way they behaved. And uh, God does the same thing. When you see, when you interact with God, he doesn't always use words, but you can tell by what's going on what he wants from you or what he wants to do. So it's not always straight from the Bible. It's not always, <laughs> I don't know anybody that's heard an audio v- word from God where they could hear him speak. That, that would be amazing. Yeah, there are some that have. But he speaks differently to every one of us. And we have to be perceptive to things that are a little bit out of the norm. All right. That's, and that being ready for something that's out of the norm is part of waiting. Last one. Last slide. Not last slide, I think it's just the last idea. Practice. This isn't something we're expected to get perfect the first time, and you will make mistakes. There's a couple of things we can do when we practice. I, I, I spoke, spoke a message here a couple of years ago about the way we know for sure that that is a direction God is taking us, and there's like three lights. There's this harbor down in the States where a, a ship in, at the middle of the night can sail into the harbor if they line up the three lights and keep them to port. If they can line up those three lights and keep them to port, they can sail straight into the harbor safely. And it's kind of like our, the, when you know God is directing you to do something, if, it's, if it fits with the word, that's the one light. I mean, if, it comes, if, go, if it's contrary to the word, I guarantee you that's not God. If he's telling you to break a commandment or do something that the Bible clearly says we're not supposed to do, that's not God, sorry. <laughs> Secondly, it feels true. That's a really bizarre thing to say. But, but God's not going to come to you that he's going to get you to do something that you're not prepared to do, that he hasn't prepared you to do. So you, you, you go, oh, that is God, yeah. And then the third thing is you take it to wise counsel and your wise counsel comes back and they're like, yeah, we believe that's God. We've prayed about it and we believe that's God. Now that doesn't always happen that all three of those line up perfectly. But I'm telling you, if two of those line up, check the third. <laughs> uh, Brother France, he used to come down to the Bible college from Germany, and he would say to us, if somebody prophesies o- you over you and they say you're a horse, you go, oh, ignore that. Second person comes and says you're a horse, you go, what? That's the second time I heard that. Third person comes and prophesies to you and says you're a horse, buy a saddle. <laughs> <laughs> In saying that, nobody's going to prophesy over that you're a horse. But when three things line up, God said it three times to you. Get ready. Get ready. Yeah. The, the three things that line up, the word, the, the, if it goes against the word, yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a light that you can put in one place, right? If, if the other two may or may not line up, but the word will always line up, always, always, always line up. So how do you practice? That's the slide around, right? How do you practice? I'm going to give you a few couple steps here. Find a quiet space. Now, quiet space is two things. Quiet space is a place and it's a time. Turn off your phone. <laughs> yeah. Do you, the, the enemy loves to use our friends to keep us from getting to him. <laughs> There's nothing against our friends, right? But turning off your phone, because you can go back to it after prayer time. 
Ask him to speak. And then listen. Don't put expectations on what you were going to hear from God. This morning I put lots of expectations on what I wanted to hear from God. Tell me where my keys are. <laughs> but if we're going to go to that quiet time where we're going to practice, press, practice hearing from God, don't put any expectations on him. And then write down the impressions you get. If it's a picture, my wife does beautiful artwork from visions God's given her. And I've come home from board meetings and seen what she doodled on a piece of paper and went, that's exactly what, we're doing. that's the answer to the question we had in board meeting. Yeah, anyways. So God can speak to different people in different ways. So don't put any expectations on what, how he's going to talk to you or what he's going to say to you. Just give him the open. And then find somebody that's wise, that has wise counsel and bring them to them. Bring it to them and see what their interpretation of it is. Ask for your, an interpretation. Ask for God to speak to you and tell you what it means. But then take it to somebody else and see how that goes. Now, we have a policy here at the church that if God speaks to you during one of our services, write it down and bring it to one of our board members and pass it through. And if God has a message for this moment and this time, that you can pass it through that board member, and if they can read it and check it off, that's cool, yeah, I believe that's right. See, that's their second stage of checking. And it's, it's not because you're not worthy to come up and speak, but it's because it's just another, because everybody makes mistakes. So it's another way of checking it through and making sure it gets dealt with properly. And if you have a word from the Lord that you get for the church, we ask you to bring it to our leadership. And our leadership is going to pray about it and go over it. And sometimes it takes us a long time to pray about it and, and uh, to talk about it together. But we encourage you, don't give up. Keep bringing them to us. And we're, 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 we're reading them in board meetings and we're going through them. This is an important thing to hear from God as a church, not just an individual. And we're, we're working our way through it. So yeah. Give yourself a block of time. Allow yourself to make mistakes and keep doing it. Don't just do it once and go, that didn't work. Because he may not speak to you the first time you sit down. And you know what? He may speak to you the first time you sit down and you may interpret it wrong. But the more we do that, the more we spend time connecting with God, the more we'll... If you think about anybody in your life, any relationship you've had, when you first meet each other, you don't know how to communicate very well. But the better you know them, the better you communicate with them, the more... You're able to. Does that make sense? So don't give up. Repeat. Continue to try to hear the presence of God. And then the other side of it is not just hearing what he says, but letting him empower you to do the things you're scared to do that you know he's now telling you to do. I'll leave you with that. Next slide. It's growing in our relationship with God. Now, Part of me wants to invite you down so I can pray for you if there's anybody that struggles in this area so I can pray for you, but I got news for you. I don't have anything that I can offer to you other than just prayer that you can have the courage to try this. But everything I'm telling you today is homework. Go home and do it. If you're at home right now, online, after you shut the video down, find a, a place and a, and a time that you can try this and, and get God to speak to you out of his word or, yeah, Practice, practice, do it, do it. <laughs> Father, we thank you so much that we can hear your voice. You have, you have given us that ability so that we can communicate with you, that you can talk to us and we, of course, we can bring you our needs, we can bring you our hopes, we can bring you our desires, but we can also sit and listen to you Tell us and guide us and lead us. And tell us that you're there for us and that you feel for us. We can hear you because your sheep hear your voice. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, everybody. Why don't we just sing the last part of that Living Hope song that we sang earlier?
just to uh, kind of finish up the service this morning. I believe we're going to uh, we'll wrap up the service right now, but I think we're going to, if you want to stick around to do a little prayer for the community this afternoon, um, we're going to do that in just a few minutes. So bless you guys. Have a great week. Spend some time uh, trying to hear from God this week, being in his word. So bless you. Have a great week. We'll see you next week.